Um, the global idea here, you know, of this first part is let's just talk about what hybrid electric and electric and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are motivated by and their history. You know, what there's this change in technology that's, that we're literally in the middle of, middle of in the automotive world that we've seen over the last couple of years. What motivates that? Why, why are hybrid electric vehicles the way that we're going to be able to um, accomplish whatever these goals are that we'll, we'll put together? And, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the history of this and, and understand, of course, that these aren't new technologies, but there are some interesting things that have happened that have made them so that we can, we can think about them in a more... Um, you know, in a, we can think about them in terms of mass production and such. So, obviously, uh, you know, everybody sees these cars out here. You know, Toyota Prius came to the United States in the 2000, Escape Hybrid, um, Prius and Inside, the new models in 2010. But it's not a new concept, right? I mean, the, the uh, you know, even obviously these technologies are more than 10 years old, and uh, it even predates their, their uh, you know, uh, this this vehicle and there were dozens like them, uh, all dated back literally to the to the turn of the last century. So, um, what are you know what are some of the motivations that are causing this transition in technology that we're seeing right now? Um, you know, th there's a variety of them, and the ones that, that you know we sort of talk about a, a lot of. Um, so we can talk a little bit about kind of the history of this. So in the United States, we have, uh, we have you know, uh, actually federal legislation that is the Clean Air Act, right? And the Clean Air Act dictates uh, some minimum standards that are sort of science-based standards on how much air pollution uh, people are willing to tolerate and the government is willing to tolerate. And there are several parts of the United States, I mean, that are out of attainment, non-attainment zones for the Clean Air Act. And uh, so what happens in those places is that the, uh, those jurisdictions are allowed to come up with, with uh, management plans that will make it so that they can come into compliance with the Clean Air Act, okay? And um, so, for instance, one of the very first non-attainment zones was Southern California, the South Coast Air Quality Management District and such, which is Los Angeles and all these places. And if anybody's been to L.A., I mean, the reason that L.A. has such terrible air pollution is there's several millions of people all driving cars and doing this kind of stuff. It's a sort of a, it's a modern mega city, right, where everybody drives everywhere and there's big freeways and everything. And it's got, a, it's got a breeze that comes from offshore and blows all this pollution against the mountains. And it's just, you know, if you, it, it, on a clear day, you know, uh, driving around Los Angeles, and we walk around Los Angeles, you look up and there are these mountains that surround you that are, you know, 9,000 foot mountains, literally as close, to, as close to Los Angeles as we are to the large mountains behind us, right? And so, uh, so this air pollution literally gets trapped in there, and, and uh, so Los Angeles was one of the early like non-attainment zones. And so they, California uh, had to come up with plans to basically uh, to reduce the amount of air pollution, and they found that cars were one of the major sources of, of air pollution. And so um, emission standards are, were all developed on the basis of, you know, Los Angeles case studies and how to uh, allow Los Angeles to meet the Clean Air Act. Um, you know, fuel economy, greenhouse gas emission standards, uh, all these kind of things all are, um, you know, policy driven because of things like air pollution problems. So obviously, you know, the idea is that, you know, one of the sort of, you know, major takeaways, I think, and the kind of thing that we can communicate to students is that, uh, is that things like transportation and even, uh, you know, any of the actions that we take sort of have this environmental tail that's attached to them, right? That, that uh, even if your car, you know, is not belching black smoke or something, there's still pollution that's coming out of it. There's still, whether it's uh, carbon dioxide or, or uh, in this case, we're really talking about criteria air pollutants. And a lot of those are things like NOx, carbon monoxide, unburned hydrocarbons that can react in the atmosphere and cause things like ozone, acid rain, health problems like asthma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we, you know, we want to find a way to reduce that. Um, hybrid electric vehicles are one of those ways. And the primary, so um, the primary reason that uh, hybrid electric vehicles reduce air pollution is that, um, you know, sort of, they reduce carbon dioxide on the, on the basis of basically that they burn less fuel and they can reduce 
air pollution on the basis that they, we, we can control the way that the engine works a little bit differently. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the major motivations is definitely to, to reduce air pollution. The second one is, you know, sort of more global environmental impact. So CO2 is a greenhouse gas, of course. Everybody understands that, um, you know, that, uh, that CO2 is, is leading to, um, you know, global climate change and all this kind of stuff. A lot of the transportation uh, transportation is a major source of CO2, and we're going to see, of course, more and more transportation-based CO2 emissions coming from industrialized countries. So this is a, you know, this is a graph that shows um, basically where CO2 comes from um, and, and CO2 emissions. And what now? I heard hydrogen. Hydrogen? Oh, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> We might have, we, we'll, laughing, we'll so try to have a little, yeah. <laughs> this is the dry part. <laughs> no, go ahead. I did bring up hydrogen. So yeah. a couple of questions I have with yeah. motivation. So yeah. that death of the electric car. Yeah, um, who killed the electric yeah, car, yeah. Who killed the electric yeah. car, what, that was early 90s. So yeah. why all of a sudden now is there a shift in the auto industry to offer hybrid electrics and plug-in? And what's happened with, um, hydrogen fuel cells is that just because of the danger of hydrogen and yeah so there's a right no so you're exactly right so the the, the you know if you think about you know we sort of talk about uh, the, you know this timeline right I mean uh, so it, at the, in the 1900s that we had lots and we had lots of electric cars and all this kind of stuff like that and then in so in 1990 at the 19 I think it's the, I think it's the 1990 LA Auto Show um, GM built an electric car and demonstrated it at the, at the LA Auto Show. It was called the GM Impact, or, yeah, Impact. Yeah, so this is actually the precursor to that, right. even. It was, I think it's called Impact. And it, whether it was 88 or 90, I, I have to look it up. But, um, so the, the, the global idea is that, so, so actually what happened is that the, uh, you know, the, the, the legislators saw that car and said, oh, this is great, GM's going to make an electric car. We should, we should let them make an electric car and encourage them to do that. That'd be really good, right? And so GM, you know, sort of went and did that, and it turned out that they, that car was too expensive for them to mass produce. And so really what's, you know, so the global idea here is that actually, uh, you know, the market success of electric vehicles and hybrid electric vehicles is driven, of course, by the marketplace, right? It's driven by what you can sell and driven by... Uh, how, at what price point you can make it and how many people desire it at that price point, right? It's, it's sort of an economics problem. And in 1990, in 19, you know, 1990, uh, uh, they were not, you know, you couldn't sell cars at that price point. I mean, that, you know, I've heard numbers that, you know, I probably shouldn't say this on tape, right? But I've heard numbers that were like the EV1 was $180,000 per vehicle to make. And they were leasing them for $500 a month, right? And so, you know, there's no... GM just lost a lot of money on that, right? And so part of the thing is, um, so now what's you know, what, what are we hoping has changed But in that time period is that the costs have gone down to the point now where you can buy a Nissan Leaf for, you know, whatever it is on the order of $35,000 or something like that. And, um, and that's a price point that we might actually be able to consider, right? I mean, and so, uh, so it's an important point that we talk about the sort of, environmental benefits and we talk about greenhouse gas benefits and stuff like that but that actually doesn't motivate anybody to buy cars what motivates you is what is, it, what is your desire how much are you willing to pay for it all that kind of stuff like that fuel cells are an important you know fuel cells are also an important technology and basically the, the automotive industry really believes that fuel cells will be the technology that drives our cars 40 years from now 30 years from now something like that um, and Fuel cells, you know, have some def you know, have some benefits. We could probably, t I mean, we, you know, we didn't include them in the discussion that we're going to have tomorrow on batteries and stuff like that. But we should, we should probably talk about the electro electrochemistry of fuel cells and stuff like that and how it sort of compares. But the global idea here is that, um, you know, what's actually been driving and what's been keeping fuel cells out of the market to date is really basically cost again. So they are more expensive. I don't, you know, I, I personally, and I don't think that any automaker really believes that. There's a safety problem that's associated with compressed hydrogen or compressed natural gas or anything else like that. I think that 
uh, you know, as, as technical as engineers, we'd sort of say we, can, we have solved that problem. We know what that's going to look like in the future. Um, it's really just driven by cost, that fuel cells right now are too expensive. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, anyway, so the global idea here is that, of course, you know, we are all, we all want, you know, we all want to live in a world where tr personal transportation is one of our, you know, sort of uh, God-given rights, right? Where we all want to drive a car, we all want to, uh, we all want to live, you know, two or three miles from where we work. That's, that's the way we want to operate. That's our first world lifestyle. And so, you know, of course, every other developing country in the world also wants the same thing. And so, for instance, now China actually produces more uh, carbon dioxide than the United States does as a product of its industrialization, as a product of its, of its adopting a first world type of lifestyle that includes cars. This is an example, actually. So, for instance, that, that's a, uh, it's called a Tata Nano. It's a, uh, a $2,500 car that's sold in India and uh, you can buy it, and it's great, right? I mean, you know, if you're a sort of a middle-class person, uh, imagine that, you know, the, the, you would get to achieve the freedom that goes along with personal transportation for $2,500, but of course it's, you know, it also burns more fuel than a, than a, uh, than a motorcycle or a bicycle or whatever it was that you're upgrading towards. So we'll, we're gonna see this, that, you know, actually now the United States is not the largest auto market in the world. Uh, actually, the United States is not the largest CO2 producer in the world, so our sort of uh, importance in this picture becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we need to get these technologies that are low CO2 technologies out there and allow other people to, um, to take advantage of them. The, of course, we also, everybody sees the effects of this at the pump all the time that, uh, you know, we now have, uh, we're, we sort of enter a world where the amount of uh, money that we pay for transportation uh, is going up and up and up. We we have lower petroleum, res, you know, um, lower reserves of petroleum over time. Uh, these are things that are worrisome. But again, it mostly, you know, it's sort of this is a little bit abstract. Mostly, what you'll see it in is increased uh, prices that we pay at the pump. So, high, you know, I, our, we sort of have supposed that hybrid electric vehicles and, and electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are a way that we can solve some of these problems, are a way that we can divorce ourselves from, you know, from what we want. We, we, can, di we can divorce what we want, which is personal transportation, away from the impacts of that personal transportation, that environmental tail, right? We can divorce ourselves from the price at the pump, from the, uh, you know, amount of CO2 emissions that we put out and from the increasing costs of cars that pollute less and less and less, right? So the question is, you know, and this we get sort of a little bit technical here, technical here but why combine this gasoline engine and the electric motor? Um, and what about hybrid electric vehicles makes them, you know, more efficient, whatever, less polluting than conventional cars? This is the sort of laundry list of those things and we'll talk about them, you know, from a sort of a, you know, in, in, in general here. Um, but the global idea is what it can do is you have a you have a engine in your car, and the engine in that in your car um, powers whatever you tell it to do with your gas pedal, right? What hybrid electric vehicles allow you to do is basically to isolate the engine from the operating conditions. So, in a conventional car, when you drive, you know, when you press the gas pedal to accelerate away from the stop, the engine has to provide that power. In a hybrid electric vehicle, it can either be the engine or it could be the electric motor. And there's sort of, you know, we can, we can envision and construct trade-offs as to which is better. Um, so we'll talk about that. Uh, regenerative braking. Regenerative braking is a way to capture energy from slowing the vehicle down and store it to be able to drive, use, it, you know, use it to drive the vehicle again. We can downsize the engine. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We have stuff like able, you're able to drive in an electric mode. Uh, we have electrified accessories like uh, power brakes and power steering and all this kind of stuff like that. No engine idle and what we'll call energy banking. But that's the sort of laundry list of them. Let's talk a little bit about how each one of those things maybe kind of works and how, um, what, you know, for instance, isolating the engine from the vehicle operating conditions might buy one fuel economy, okay? It's, it's uh, so. For instance, 
This is a map, okay, of, of the way that an engine operates. On this axis is the engine speed, and on this action axis is the engine power. And the little islands that are on there are uh, fuel consumption, and it's got units, funny units of um, grams per kilowatt hour. It's, it's, uh, uh, but it's basically efficiency. So the lower the number here, the less fuel it requires to make a certain amount of energy, a certain kilowatt hours of energy. So uh, this is a typical engine you might find in a mid-sized car. It makes 100 kilowatts. There's 75, 75 kilowatts is about 100 horsepower. So this is, uh, you know, whatever that is, 100 and, uh, 30, 140 horsepower engine. Uh, and you can see things that you would expect. For instance, the max engine power is at 4,000 RPMs, right? So the higher you rev up your engine, the more power it can make, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? This line here is a line that represents the maximum amount of engine power that you can make. So if you're at 1,000 RPM, you can only make about 20 kilowatts. As, you, as your engine goes faster and faster, you make more and more power with the pedal pressed all the way to the ground. All right? So now, the only question is here, for instance, uh, how, so this, this uh, maximum efficiency island here is at something about half speed and full almost full uh, you know, accelerator pedal all the way to the floor. So that's, this is at about, let's say, 80 kilowatts and 3,000 RPM is the maximum efficiency of this engine, right? So let's, does anybody know about how much power does it take to drive a car down the road at 60 miles an hour? Any guesstimates? In kilowatts or horsepower, I don't care. I mean, whatever. It's like 30 or 40 horsepower. It's, so that would be pretty close. So like, for instance, I know a Chevy Suburban. To drive a Chevy Suburban down the road at 60 miles an hour takes 23 kilowatts, which is about 30 horsepower, right? A uh, Chevy Malibu, to drive a Chevy Malibu down the road at, um, at 60 miles an hour takes about 8 kilowatts or 14 or 13 horsepower or whatever like that. So it's actually like remarkably low power, right? So think about that. It doesn't take that much power to drive it down the road. So let's put that, you know, let's put that condition on this, um, on this map here, right? So let's say, let's say we're driving, you know, this is, again, I sort of talked about this as a mid-sized car. So let's say we're doing that at 10 kilowatts or so, all right? And so you're driving, what speed would you be driving the engine at if you were driving down the road at 60 miles an hour? You know, you might be in fifth gear, right, at 60 miles an hour, 2,000 RPM maybe, something like that, just to throw out a number. So you're operating way, way down here at an efficiency, or, at, you know, at a brake-specific fuel consumption of 700 or uh, 800 grams per kilowatt hour. Um, so your efficiency in, for this engine is really, really low, right? You're operating this, this engine, even when you're driving down the highway, which you think should be, it should be the most efficient you could, you know, you, one would hope, if one were one to design this, uh, you know, uh, the engine to match the car, you would probably try to match up that peak efficiency point with that long-range fuel, long-range long, long range driving sort of number. But it doesn't match very well, right? So wh why is this engine so, uh, why, why, why does it have so much power, right? I mean, shouldn't, could we, uh, could we, you know, could we shrink a little, a little bit so that we lined up this, this dot here, or maybe even just this dot with, with there? Why does it have to have so much power? You're saying it's carrying around too much range to that rate. Yeah, right. I mean, so, so you're, you've got a bigger engine. You've got a giant engine in there, right? Well, yeah, so that's the thing, right? You so, do you need it? Yeah, I mean, we all want it. Do we, do we need it? Yeah, we sometimes need it. I mean, you know, I, I don't think anybody really. Uh, would tolerate a, you know, let's say a 40 horsepower mid-sized car or something like that, right? You try to accelerate to get on the road and it would go blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, or a grade, exactly. That's all a problem. So there's compromises that have to be um, negotiated when you are, si you know, sizing the engine of a car. And we all, that, so this is, you know, for instance, this is why a Ferrari gets eight miles per gallon is because this engine is so oversized, not just 100 kilowatts, it's at 300 kilowatts. So instead of operating here, you're operating like, I mean, it's just putting around with the throttle completely closed, losses all over the place, 
very low fuel efficiency, right? So hybrid electric vehicles offer us a, another degree of freedom, okay? And that degree of freedom is what you could do is, for instance, if you're just driving around, putting around or something like that, you could probably turn this engine off and just drive around on electric or, or whatever, right? Or you could, and, and then when, you know, for if you, for instance, need to do something that's more an acceleration or something, you could operate this engine up here at, so that it's making more power, you're accelerating, you're operating it at a little bit higher efficiency. Um, but then when you're just kind of putting around, if you're sitting and idling, or if you're just cruising around town at 50 miles an hour, without doing anything too exciting, you could just turn it off, right? So, that I, so that's, the, that's the degree of freedom that, that hybridization buys a conventional car. It allows you to disconnect the amount of power that you're making at any particular instant from the amount of power that you actually need at any particular instant, right? You can store that energy, you can do anything else with it. So that's what we're gonna, tr that's what we're gonna try to achieve with any one of these hybrid electric vehicle um, architectures or... or, or, or uh, Can I get that slide from you? Did yeah, you yeah, yeah. All, this is all your guys' stuff, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is all... Okay. Yeah, we you can, can download. Like, pull that yeah. image out and use yeah. it in class and talk about it. Yeah, and exactly. So, um, so... F slide uh, actually, from uh, a... It, it's from a a book from yeah, Paul Krabek. It's actually, no, it's Paul Krabek, uh, who's, a, I, I, I can't remember where he's at, but. Um, so, but it gives you an idea, okay? The second piece is to talk about regenerative, uh, you know, the, the, so I listed them and we're going over them in terms of their relative importance, okay? So the most important thing is that divorcing of engine power from vehicle power, right? That's, there's so much freedom in there that we can do a lot of things. The second piece is what's called regenerative braking. And every hybrid, every plug-in hybrid, every electric car does this because it's so valuable. And the idea is basically what it does is it recaptures braking energy. In the conventional car, the way conventional cars work, right, is you have brakes and brake calipers and uh, they basically slow down the car with the friction, right, with friction applied to the to the brakes. And so all of the heat of the conventional car is, uh, the, uh, the, all the kinetic energy that the conventional car has driving around, you know, uh, becomes dissipated as heat off of those, um, off of those, uh, uh, off the brake drums or the brake friction. rotors or anything else. It's friction losses, right? And you, we can do a calculation, I mean, you know, sort of like we can do a simple calculation to, fig that, to give you an I idea of how much um, energy there is in there, right? I mean, maybe it's just, maybe it's boring for people, but, you know, we can calculate the kinetic energy that has, in, you know, in units of joules, right? That is one half the mass of the vehicle. So let's try that as like a 1500 kilogram car, a medium sized car, and V squared, and I'm going to do it in metric units so that it's not too confusing. But it's basically, you know, um, you can. Do this yourself, right? But I'm going to do it approximately. So half and uh, times 900. So we get something like, you know, um, you know, we get something like whatever. Let's just call it seven uh, ten to the four. So, uh, and did I miss a, no, that seems 675 and three zeros, okay. So, basically, you know, we got this much kinetic energy here, right? Okay, so then what we can do is we can basically go in and calculate based on, um, you know, the amount of work that we're doing is M times the specific heat and a delta T. So, if you do you know, this sort of thing here. We can calculate the delta T that goes along with this, uh, you know, with a braking event. And what you basically find is actually a braking event from 60 miles an hour to, um, to uh, six, seven, five, to zero 
gives us some, let's say we got a 10 kilogram rotor and CP of this is 620 um, joules per kilogram Kelvin, you end up with about, a, so, yeah, okay, 108 degrees C delta temperature in your brake rotors from a 60 to zero. It's like a big, you know, so that's, you, you went from, you went from uh, 20 degrees C to above the boiling point of water or whatever, just in one braking event. All that energy gets dissipated as heat in this brakes, right? So it would be great, of course, if we could take this 675 kilojoules and put it into the battery pack or use it to drive the car. It's a lot of, you know, it's, that's how much energy it would take to go, the, the amount of energy it takes to go, of course, from 60 to zero is the amount of energy that it would take to go from zero to 60 if you had a perfectly efficient system, right? We don't quite have a perfectly efficient system, but the global idea is like, that's a lot of energy. Like that could get you back up to some sort of, you know, a reasonable speed, right? So there's energy there. Uh, it gets captured basically by the electric motor and back, it gets stored through in the batteries. That's something that conventional vehicles just can't do. So it's a little bit indicative there of what goes on. Are the there systems like I remember reading a long time ago about flywheels that will spin or yeah. compressed air that will charge. Or All those things are absolutely viable. Um, you know, like they're technically viable, and it's really just a question of what's, um, you know, what's commercially viable. So actually, uh, we, did a, we do a project, and uh, we actually work with um, Parker, that's a big company that, that makes hydraulic components, on hydraulic hybrids, where instead of using batteries, you basically have a hydraulic pump, and it pumps hydraulic fluid to do the exact same thing. It stores it in, you know, it stores up pressure in an accumulator, in a pressure vessel, exactly. And so there's nothing wrong with those same ideas. I mean, it, you, anything that you can think of, people have definitely tried. I mean, there are, there are pneumatic hybrids, there are flywheel hybrids, there are, uh, you know, battery hybrids, there are ultracapacitor hybrids, there are actually, you know, electrochemical sort of hybrids that have fuel cells and electrolyzers that can go back and forth. Anything like that are all real. It really just becomes a question of cost and consumer acceptability and what people actually want to do. So actually, so the, for hydraulic hybrids, for instance, the major application is huge trucks. So if you were, for instance, driving a garbage truck, uh, it, those, are all, those have so much power requirements that you almost couldn't uh, do it with a battery. And so in, in those sort of conditions, yeah, hydraulic hybrid or something like that would be great. And people have talked about actually flywheel buses and that has the exact same problem that, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of power and it takes a lot of torque to accelerate a city bus from zero to 10 miles an hour all the time, you know, every 30 seconds all day long. That's more than a battery can really do uh, it, in, in some applications. And so the idea is like, uh, uh, any of those things, you know, it, it, everything has its sort of strengths and weaknesses, and so it's just compromises among those things. So, um, so for instance, we just talked a little bit about the idea that uh, that y that you know we can divorce the so we can divorce the operation of the engine from the uh, from the operation of the vehicle with a hybrid electric vehicle. In the same way, for instance, what we could do is we could actually build a car that has, that, for instance, in a mid-sized car, has only, say, 30 horsepower or something like that. And it, we could make it so that it still had acceptable performance by having an electric motor that would provide the acceleration events or whatever, the acceleration power. So uh, what that's called is basically engine downsizing. So for instance, this is the this is the same sort of graph that we looked at before. This has contours of engine efficiency now in terms of actually efficiency in terms of percent. And a line on it that's a line of constant power. This is speed and torque, a line of constant power at 23 kilowatts. So this would be, you know, whatever. Um, uh, this was actually for, our, for a Chevy Suburban that I, that I built. Um, but basically the idea is that uh, you could you can downsize the engine so that this 23 kilowatt operating line sort of, in, you know, if this is a, this, this one was a 1.9 liter, and so this would be a, a 0. Uh, for instance, 0. 0.9 liter or something like that, and basically would be a much smaller engine. Now it only makes about, you know, 40 horsepower or so, 
and, but the efficiency at steady state operating conditions is much, much higher, right? So f that's the reason why, for instance, think about, you know, the first generation Toyota Prius ha had a 43 kilowatt uh, engine. So it had about, you know, it was like, whatever, it was 60 horsepower or something like that. A 60 horsepower engine in a mid-sized car. Chevy, the Chevy Malibu you're going to see today has a 220 horsepower engine in a mid-sized car, right? And so um, that, that engine downsizing makes the Prius more efficient. It makes it so that the engine is operating at higher load, and, um, but it comes with this compromise that, that if you didn't have an electric motor to, to allow it to do 0 to 60, you'd just be driving a, you know, a uh, very low-performance car. And that's perfectly, you know, it's sort of like there's nothing really wrong with that either. I mean, I remember the days when, uh, when uh, Geo, Chevy, right, sold a car that had a 0 0.99 liter engine in it. It was like, you know, 45 horsepower, and the car got 60 miles per gallon. It was a three-cylinder engine, right, in a, in a Geo Metro. And they, they sold those things. I mean, right, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just... A co it's just a compromise that you have to make, and that what hybrid electric vehicles let you do is, is not have to compromise performance in order to get efficiency. The lo there, there's lots of other sort of things. Um, for instance, we talk about electric, electric drive mode, and electric drive mode is just that if you, for instance, had to do a short trip, you could just use electric energy, never start the engine at all. That's really great for your fuel efficiency, of course. It makes it so that there's, your fuel economy is infinite. Electrified accessories, including water pump, air conditioning, and power steering, are in general more efficient, can be operated more efficiently than belt-driven accessories. Um, engine idle is a really important part of the EPA fuel economy test. If you can eliminate engine idle, you can eliminate all the fuel consumption that goes along with that, uh, which is important. And energy banking, which is basically a way to operate the engine um, uh, the, the, the basic idea here is that the, if the engine, it, it's wasteful, if the engine efficiency is less than the maximum engine efficiency times the battery in-out efficiency. And so you can do some calculations that say that, um, for instance, that you could operate the engine in some condition like, you know, on this map, for instance, you could operate the engine at high efficiency, uh, bring up the battery state of charge, and then turn it off, drive around on electric, and then operate it here and do this kind of thing like that. It's actually a really minor part of the energy efficiency of, of engines. So, any questions or whatever yeah, on that? Yeah, go ahead. Energy less than and max. So, right. So, for instance, like let's look at this engine uh, here. This max efficiency here is something like 30. Uh, you know, I think I, the number I used was 33 percent. All right. So, for instance, if the what this basically means is that. Uh, you could operate the engine at 33% efficiency and charge the batteries, right? And if you do that, then um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll draw us the way that I do in class too. So let's say we've got our let's say we've got our engine here, and there's two pathways that you could go to basically make um, energy for the wheels. One is our conventional pathway here that generates, you know, that, that I, we've been talking about in these cases where, for instance, you just operate the engine and um, power the wheels directly without going through the battery. But the other way is that you could go through the battery, all right? And what I sort of, and they, let me look, make sure I get the numbers that I have from this other example case here. For instance, if the battery is 80% in-out efficient, then, um, then what I'm, so this, this comparison that we're setting up sort of says, well, the engine max efficiency is 33%. And the question is, at what efficiency should we sort of turn off the engine if we can have these two paths available? So 33% times 0.8% is 27%. And basically what this sort of says is that what you could do is, for instance, turn off the engine in any condition where it's operating under 27% efficiency. And, and, you know, so for instance, if I was driving at, uh, you know, let's say this point or whatever, then it's operating at 25% efficiency. So oh, the best thing to do is turn the engine off, 
you know, use zero fuel, and then at some later time, basically operate it up here at a higher torque regime, do it at higher efficiency, and save the energy for later. So it basically lets you set up a line under which you should turn the engine off. So it's sort of the motivation behind doing things like turning it off at idle. Um, and it tells you, for instance, like oftentimes if you're driving a Prius, what would happen is you might be driving down the road, and if you're driving down the road at like 30 miles an hour, sometimes you'll just see the engine will turn off. And the reason that the engine's turning off is it's sort of saying, you know what, I'm not really using enough energy that I can, enough power here that I can operate efficiently, and so I'm going to wait. And I bet you if I wait, I'll get to some other condition where I can actually generate power more efficiently, store it in the batteries, and recharge more efficiently later. So it's sort of this... Uh, and that's all just programmed into the... It's all in the powertrain controller, yeah. So if you, like I would urge, you know, you can go to the, you can go to the uh, dealership and we, I'm sure, you know, in, in Castle Rock you guys have the same thing, but, at, you know, we go to the dealership and we, you can go and drive the car and watch the way that the engine turns on and off and all this kind of stuff like that. And it's pretty interesting, uh, uh, um, you know, you'll, you'll learn how to, uh, you know, how it operates, what it's, what it's trying to think about. On the, and it's all on the basis of these exact things we're talking about. Is there a reason they don't give more control to the driver to select? So the new... Like if you drive up yeah. the mountains, you're like, oh, I wish I could use more of this now because I know that the crest is coming up. So, so the answer is that actually in... I think you'll see that changing. Um, the conventional way that people, that these powertrain controllers were all designed is that oh, well, don't change anything about the way that people drive now, right? I mean, and, and especially as Americans, right, we all drive automatic transmission cars with the, with, you know, where the only inputs you're giving it are gas and brake and all this kind of stuff like that. So the, uh, the, uh, the default, at least right now, is to basically remove control from the driver. Now, um, it gets back to this idea that we can compromise that if the benefits are big enough, right? I mean, if... For instance, the Chevy Volt has what's called a mountain mode. And if you sort of, you know, you get in a Chevy Volt and you turn on the key, you get in there and you sort of say to yourself, hey, I'm going to drive to Aspen today. And so I got to go up over the pass and I got to go down the other way or whatever. And I want to make sure that I can be bolting up the pass at 75 miles an hour so that I'm not getting tailgated or whatever, right? And all you do is you just press mountain mode. The, the engine turns on, it charges the battery, you know, it, 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 even as you're driving around from Fort Collins to the I-70 or whatever, it charges the battery up so that you start at the, you basically start at the bottom of the mountain with a full battery charge and everything else is great. Now, there's a, you know, you won't get 55 miles per gallon getting there, you might get 40 or whatever, but it's probably worth your compromise to go to be able to drive all the way up there. The second half of the trip all back down. Because, because right, you know? exactly, exactly. And they, you know, and we've talked to Chevy engineers where they will, uh, you know, they come from Detroit, they drive up Vail Pass to guarantee that their car, radiator, battery cooling, everything else is sized just right so that it can, you can zip over Vail Pass at 70 miles an hour with no problem, right? So all you're doing is you're just pushing a little button that puts it into that same mode that those Chevy engineers used to do that. Uh, another example of that is actually the new plug-in Prius has an EV button. And actually, I think even the non-plug-in Prius now has an EV button. So if you're driving to the grocery store and you're going to go at like 20 miles an hour, you don't really need to go all that fast or whatever, and you don't want to burn gas, you just push the EV button, you drive there, and it's no big deal. Do these cars not have these modes for some groups? Yeah, so it's just, it depends on the... It depends on the maker. Uh, so, for instance, the old Priuses didn't have an EV mode in the United States, but they did in Japan. Because in Japan, people, they sort of judged that people wanted more control of their car. And in the United States, they judged that people yeah, want less control. Yeah. But I thought other cars would have modes too. Like EV mode Yeah, right. So, I mean, I think, and, and, and oftentimes, I mean, it's like an eco mode, like almost, like lots of cars now have eco modes that you can push. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I, the, you know, and I, uh, at least my, you know, my understanding is that part of the reason that cars have an eco mode is because you can, you're, the, uh, you're allowed to do fuel economy and emissions testing in eco mode if there's an eco mode. So the, it has advantages for the automaker to do that stuff. But uh, yeah, those are good and it's good questions. So okay, so uh, global, you know, this is just sort of more stuff. But the global idea is that actually, you know, it there were. Um, Back in the very, very beginning of the automotive industry, uh, electric vehicles actually had a lot of advantages over conventional cars. They were cleaner, you, you know, you didn't have to, there wasn't oil and smoke and flame and whatever else all over the place. Um, they self-started, this was back in the day when, when a man had to start the car and stuff like that, and so they were better for women. Um, there's all sorts of reasons, right? And at, at that time, there was, you know, I think we would all sort of say, right? I mean, like, gasoline cars are are uh, um, complicated, and so there was a lot to be said for a car that was just a pure electric car. Um, we talked a little bit about different types of hybrids here, but basically, you know, again, what sort of happened is that um, the, that the, with some, with the uh, with the invention, basically, of the transistor. We sort of entered this new technological space where the um, where the the, the uh, you know power electronics that are needed to make hybrid electric cars work became less and became less expensive. It, we developed new battery chemistries like the EV1 ran on a nickel metal hydride battery, and basically the major the major major thing that has reduced the cost of hybrid electric vehicles to the point where we can have electric cars now is actually the lithium ion battery. And what happened there is that, you know, we we primed the market for lithium ion batteries by all going out and buying lithium ion laptops and lithium ion cell phones and lithium lithium ion iPods or whatever else, right? And so what happened is that there's this huge now market for lithium for advanced high power lithium ion batteries. And um, the auto industry is now to the point where they can take advantage of that. And so, you know, we're basically, so, um, you know, this is some more stuff about the sort of history, but the, in, you know, the, the major driver for the cost in the EV1 was batteries and um, power electronics. And basically what happened is that actually, you know, I'll go back to the Prius here, but the, what basically happened is that actually Toyota in, um, so in, in, when they introduced the Prius in Japan in 1997, they uh, uh, you know, made some really strategic moves to, uh, you know, to incorporate into Toyota some power electronics manufacturers, battery manufacturers, all these kind of things like that. And so they were ba basically able to get uh, sort of vertical integration where they can control and dictate the costs that they pay for, um, uh, for you know, high power IGBT, the uh, transistors that make um, power electronics work in cars, they're able to control battery costs, all this kind of stuff like that. And that's the only thing that made Prius um, the most successful car, hybrid electric vehicle to date, is that you could sell them at $23,000, um, which was, which made them competitive, right? So, uh, but, you know, of course, the basic idea here is that there's some more, there's some more history that's just sort of fun stuff. I love pictures of, you know, 1975 Buick Skylarks converted to hybrid electric vehicle. Um, and I've, you know, I've got more of those too. But basic idea is that we, you know, we got more and more, more and more interest, more and more economic viability that came with this commercialization stuff. So, so they, 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 yeah, they are a little bit. I mean, um, there's, I mean, so there's definitely a lot of sort of small companies that are doing that, and you know, we've got some actually that are that are local here, um, that. That, for instance, will, uh, but but part of the thing I think is that you know, the automotive industry is really really competitive, right? I mean, it's sort of like you know, it's like an oligopoly, right? That there's we only have, you know, in the U.S. U.S. and Japan, the major makers, right? We only have like six car companies that are really, um, that are really there. So it's really hard to break into that kind of a you know, to break into that market. They will, like, uh, you know, if Chevy were to build a hybrid electric truck, which they have, of course, um, they will do it, they can always do it cheaper than 
than just a conversion kit, right? Because they can get parts cheaper, they can mass produce them, all the reasons that we don't build our own cars in our backyard or whatever, right? So, um, so it's always so it's always pretty hard to compete against the auto industry. There are a couple places where small companies are building hybrid electric vehicles and they can make it work. And they're in niche markets, right? I mean, so some of those are, for instance, Department of Defense applications. Like, there's lots of companies, and and you know, they're not necessarily small companies, but they might, but they don't, they're not companies that are huge into, um, you know, the the automotive industry that are making, um, you know, electric vehicles for for the Department of Defense. I mean, Smith Electric Trucks is one that sort of comes to mind. They're a company that is building electric, you know. Sort of, they look like delivery vans or whatever. Um, things like so that's a niche application. I mean, Tesla, for instance, electric cars is a uh, um, Tesla Motors is the name of the company, and and they basically make electric cars, and they're a niche application, right? I mean, they don't make um, they don't make a midsize car right now. They make a luxury sports car thing that is only meant to appeal to these people. So you need to find some applications where it's either cost insensitive or you know, maybe something that gives you a edge, right? Because if you try to go, you know, if, even no matter how smart we are and how much technology we've got, it's hard to compete with GM, right? I mean, they kind of know what they're doing on these fronts. Well, and in part, that's because of the political and economic and monetary connections with big oil, etc. that drive this thing. And, I, uh, you know, you, you have to be naive to think that Big oil and the money behind energy, tied with the banks and tied to the politicians, uh, where that money influences directs kind of what's happening. So so, unless you do come up with something unique, and as long as it's not a threat, yeah, as long as I'll it's tell you, an economic threat to the bigger companies, then okay, you do your thing. Anybody I'll tell you, I mean, I'll tell you my sort of perspective on that too. Is you know we talk to we talk to energy companies all the time. And um, you know, so in my in my opinion, you know, I don't think anybody sees a scenario where we're going to like leave oil in the ground, really, right? I mean, so as time goes on, the price of oil will go up or whatever, and that will motivate more and more exploration, and we'll we'll you know, there might be less and less quantity or whatever, but but whatever reserves are there are going to be extracted, and. And transportation and even things like, you know, if we double the efficiency of the, of the fleet, um, which is actually basically what is proposed between now and 2025, the new corporate average fuel economy standards are going to raise the average fuel, econ average fuel economy of cars in the U.S. to 52 miles per gallon. It's going to be incredible. I mean, I have no, you know, we don't even really know how that's going to happen, but it's going to be incredible. We're gonna, that's a doubling of the fuel economy of the fleet. We're st it's still going to be a huge chunk of the pie, right? We still, you know, we can go back to that fuel import uh, slide and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, it's still going to be this giant chunk. I mean, we still won't even be energy independent in the United States. It's going to be so. So part of the thing is, you know, I don't think that I mean energy companies and petroleum companies and stuff like that. They've got a strong play, right? I mean, like they're not going to. We're not going to leave any oil on the ground. There's not going to be some world where, where we just, you know, completely stop burning oil. I mean, that's that's not going to happen, right? So they don't have to worry too much about that. What they, you know, I, it, in my opinion, in fact, uh, you know, what what they want to do is they want to make sure that they've got that in their in their pocket, and that they go off and can help realize whatever the new transportation is going to be. And if maybe that's fuel cells, in which case every large petroleum company has a, has a hydrogen energy research and development and, and uh, uh, production group. I mean, every one of them, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, every one of them, you know, if we move to electric cars, our grid right now is... Uh, is um, Actually, this is the year. This is the year that it's natural. The, the U.S. grid burned more natural gas than coal, right? And so, um, so every you know every uh, petroleum company has play in that as well. So it's like you know I wouldn't I wouldn't lose too much sleep worrying about where the profits are going to come from for for petroleum 
companies, right? And so the question, you know, so I, so in my opinion, in fact, like I, I think that they're actually being strategic about these things and saying this this is a potential new market. I mean, electrification of, of vehicles and fuel cells and alternative transportation, all this kind of stuff is a new market, and they want to get their foot in the door too. Should we perceive them trying to maintain that price per kilowatt hour per mile or whatever, or do you think we'll eventually get cheap transportation again? Well, so, um, so I think that, I mean, what we're going to try, I mean, so for instance, if you have a hybrid car, like even if you just go out and buy a you know, a, a hybrid car that gets 50 miles per gallon now, you've basically halved your personal sensitivity to oil price changes or anything else like that, right? So, you know, from, on some level, that's, it's really good for you, um, but there's nothing that they can, you know, there's nothing that anybody can do to change, you know, like there's nothing an oil company can do to make you not buy a Prius, I think, right? Uh, well, and make faster, bigger, louder cars. Right. I mean, that's the problem is they always hit you where you're most sensitive, right? Which is your personal love for a, for a 300 horsepower Chevy Camaro, right? I mean, that's like, that's what we all would dream of, right? But uh, anyway, yeah. So, I, you know, I, I, I just, I'm not so sure I have seen, um, you know, I'm not so sure that I've seen sort of, impacts from, I, from, U, from U.S. auto industry and from um, energy industry and that sort of thing that you really can't chalk up to the fundamental economics of it. I mean, that's just sort of my opinion. Well, yeah, and I think, so, you know, in my, in my opinion, again, like, I think that, um, I mean, if you want to divorce yourself in large part from the cost of fueling your car with petroleum, and those costs are the things you talk about, you know, you don't like working with the, uh, with the oil industry and you don't like wars in the Middle East and all these kind of things like that. Like electric cars are pretty darn close to that because the fueling costs of an electric car are something like five times less than the fueling costs of a conventional car. Um, they don't have to do any of those things and those are out there right now. I mean, they're available for us all individually to go out and do. And, uh, gotten by, and that's fine. So uh, you know, these are just sort of discussion points that I always that are that are interesting. It's like um, you know, for instance, everyone here has probably bought a car, right? And how important was efficiency in your par car purchasing de decision? How would you you know? Uh, how would you even, how did you even find out about efficiency of your car? Well, you go to the showroom, and how do you, how did you find out whether this was a good or bad or efficient car or whatever, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> Each one of them is kind of for a specific application. Uh-huh, different right. day of the week, well, right? It's <laughs> a very efficient car. So yeah, you can, t so this is exactly, uh, so, so we buy, so, you know, as, uh, as uh, you know, we do lots of work on energy economics and that sort of stuff, right? And um, so one of the things that we're always trying to, you know, and economic models of consumers are really simple. Often what we do is calculate a total cost of ownership and assume that people will buy whatever car is their most economically efficient car, right? Total cost of ownership. Uh, that's not the way the world actually works, right? People like you are an, out, are an outlier because you, you did, you know, a calculation of how much the tire cost. You know who else drives a Ford Focus? Is, is Ben Bernanke, right, the, the chief economist at the Fed or whatever he is, right, I mean. So, so the only people who do that are, are uh, you know, are people who are completely driven, you know, who are economic, mathematical, technological gearhead people or whatever. Right, that's right. Exactly. It's great. It's great. That's great. So you can, t you, you can tell you guys from a mile away because you drive a... a Ford Focus manual, you know, at least, I hope it's five years old, at least. It's 10 years Good. old. Good, yeah. I was, you, make, you bring a, a ray of sunshine to my heart. Because at least, at least my models describe you. That's great. <laughs>